As always, I'm thankful to be able to speak to you once again. I'm grateful for each of you being here, not only physically with us, but all those who might be viewing over the internet. If you would, be turning over to the second chapter of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Now, in this chapter, particularly in the verses we'll be reading, we're given a very rare glimpse into the childhood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the verses that we'll be reading, we see a parent's worst nightmare. Especially nowadays. We see that Mary and Joseph are returning to Nazareth. And during their journey back home, they realize that they left Jesus in Jerusalem. So Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. I'd like to read that at this time. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So we see that Mary and Joseph were faithfully discharging their obligation in journeying to Jerusalem. Yet they made one error that changed this entire event. No doubt this would be brought up in further instances, and hopefully they would laugh about it. I know sometimes today we might forget our kids at the grocery store. It's terrifying at that time. Not saying that I have, but I have heard it happening. And then several years after, it's a laughable event. But it no doubt is terrifying when you're going through it. Especially in today's society, you don't know what has happened. But nonetheless, they forgot Jesus in Jerusalem. So let us consider this event involving our adolescent Lord and thereby noticing some practical applications for us today. First, we notice that they, that is Mary and Joseph, departed. They left Jesus, not the other way around. Mary and Joseph both left Jesus in Jerusalem. As we said, they had fulfilled their obligations for being present in Jerusalem. They were there for the feast. And they were set to return to Nazareth. Which is common. You want to go back home. Yet they departed from Jesus. In similar fashion, many today have departed from Jesus. They might have obeyed his gospel at one point in time. They might have heard the gospel call and were converted. They became Christians. However, they might have yielded to temptation. And they continued within that sin. They might have chosen the pleasures of sin for a season and ultimately allowed themselves to slip back into the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Some might be wish to be indebted to the law of Moses. 
You look around, most of the denominational world today makes this attempt. Where they read the Bible, well, I'm going to listen to what Exodus has to say for my salvation. And they look to the law of Moses as to how to live today. Well, these people are not rightly dividing the word of truth. But Paul has an answer for this. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. They might have clinged to the law of Moses, yet because of this lost Christ in their own lives. They had fallen from grace. So it is possible that Christians can lose their salvation. They can indeed fall from grace. And as we said, many in the denominational world cling to this idea. They don't handle or write the word of God. They don't realize that Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 5 states that this law of Moses was given to the children of Israel and to them only. It wasn't given to their fathers and it is no longer binding upon us today because of the cross of Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. Now let us notice then how Jesus can be lost in one's life. It happens by choice. This point is made in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. Jesus there speaking says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. You see, when you're in the sheepfold of Christ, you're protected. No one is ever able to steal you from God's hand. So how can one ever be lost? They must choose to leave. You can never lose your salvation because someone makes you. You have to choose to lose Christ. A Christian can only become lost due to their own choice or choices. This is done by choosing to leave the doctrine of Christ. 2 John verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth or goeth beyond, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So the doctrine is important. If you go on from it, you're no longer abiding in the doctrine of Christ. You have not God. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 tells us that God does not change. When God makes a promise, He remains true to that promise. He will fulfill it. He will perform those things which He has promised. He has promised salvation to man through obedience. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 reads, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. <coughs> Excuse me. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. God has the ability to save us. He has set forth a promise to do so. He has even outlined the means and the terms of our salvation. Yet what separates us from him? It's our iniquities. The choices that we make can cause our separation between us and our God. We choose whether or not to lose Jesus in Jerusalem. Second, we look at this account. They supposed that Jesus was still with them. Mary and Joseph simply took for granted that Jesus was part of the company, that he was still with them. 
We might wonder why this couple didn't verify where he was. But sometimes that's very easy to do. You think little whippersnappers are all planned together. They'll be with us. And you just kind of take that for granted. Either way, they did not verify whether or not Jesus was in their company. As a result, they lost Jesus. Many today suppose that Jesus is with them be simply because they profess to be believers. Yet how many, in fact, take the time to make sure that his presence is indeed with them? Part of this is done by searching the scriptures. This is a personal obligation, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Each and every one of us is expected to study out God's word for ourselves. It's not going to occur by osmosis. If you put your Bible under your pillow at night, you're not going to grow in knowledge of the truth. It's impossible. You've got to take the time to study out for yourselves. You cannot claim that I am a believer, therefore Jesus is with me. It doesn't work like that. Many instead choose to blindly follow those who teach in religion and their doctrines. How many can we think of that follow the example found in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12? It says, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So these Bereans verified by the scriptures those things that they had been taught. Well, who was teaching them? It was Paul and Silas. These people had the gall to question the words of an apostle of God. Absolutely. So why don't we do that today? Question everything you're hearing right now. Is it supported by biblical truth? How many people take the time to actually do that? But then when they, they actually studied this, these matters out for themselves, what happened? Well, it says many believed. You read of these different accounts of, and stories of people that are so angry with certain teachings that they hear, so they want to study it out for themselves and prove so-and-so wrong. Well, they end up studying the scriptures, and lo and behold, they study themselves converted. That's exactly how it should work. It's not going to work any other way. However, we see that many around us and all too often those in the church as well, choose to remain blind. Matthew chapter 15, verses 12 through 14 there says, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended? Sounds like modern day younger generations in America. Knowest thou that the millennials and Gen Zers were offended? After they heard this saying, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Again, Matthew chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. You see, the faith that is built upon supposition only will always fail. Instead, one's faith must be built upon the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. This can bring about and will bring about one's confidence in their own salvation. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. 
which reads, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What man will be blessed? It's the one who obeys the perfect law of liberty. It is the one who will, upon looking into that perfect law, whenever there's a correction that must be made, they actually make that correction. Whatever is amiss in their lives, they take the steps necessary to be faithful once again. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. You can know that you're saved because you can know that you're obeying the words of Christ. It's quite simple. Never simply suppose that Jesus is with you, especially when you make, when you make no effort for him to be there. While this is an easy thing to do, that is, supposing Jesus is with you, it is most unwise because it will lead to one's own spiritual destruction. One can be and even become a reprobate, that is, one that is disqualified from entering the gates of heaven. Titus chapter 1, verse 16, and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, which reads as follows. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Then we consider that they searched for Jesus among their kindred. You see, Mary and Joseph assumed that he was still in the traveling party. They just supposed that Jesus was with the rest of the family and their friends, their acquaintances. After a day's journey, however, they realized that Jesus was not with them. So then they searched amongst their family and friends. They assumed he would be amongst those traveling with them. Again, an easy assumption to make. Again, a frightening, a frightening position to be in as a parent. So many today, though, have this mentality. They seek Jesus amongst their kindred. Many today search for Jesus within their family and their friends. Their religion is based upon the generations of that family rather than regeneration. Titus chapter 3 verse 5, John chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. The regeneration we're talking about there is that of baptism. A command set forth part of the terms of salvation. Some, some people think because mama and daddy had this religion, it's good enough for me. And that's the only qualifying mark of it. So many times religion is more like clothes given to the younger siblings. I never had that issue because I'm the oldest. Those clones are hand-me-downs, and so many times the religious practices in a family are in the same condition because there are more traditions in that family. They simply accept what has been passed down within the family, never attempting to verify these beliefs by studying the scriptures to see what God has to say on the matter. But such traditions are not scriptural. Jesus warned the religious leaders of his day of such traditions. 
Matthew chapter 15, the first nine verses. It says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, but whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God by none effect, by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Keeping a tradition, no matter what it is, for the sake of having a tradition, is dangerous. This is especially true regarding matters of true religion. It brings about vain worship, and ultimately attempts to make the commands of God void. We must realize that the words of man will not judge us in the last day. No matter how dearly we hold our family, they will not judge us when this life in the flesh is over. The views of great-grandpappy won't matter. Clinging to mama and daddy's religion because they clung to it, well, that will not save us. Jesus said that he came to bring salvation to the world. Yet those that don't believe in him were already lost. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. What will judge us in that last day? It's none other, none other than the words of Christ. John chapter 12, verses 44 through 50. It says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. We're getting back to our choices. We don't have to abide in, in darkness because of Christ. We choose to. Verse 47, And if any man hear my words, and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save keeping in mind the world is already condemned. Verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He knoweth that his commandment is life everlasting. Excuse me, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. In verse 50, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So what Jesus is saying, it's not only me saying these things, but it's God the Father. These are the words that will judge us in that last day. Not the traditions handed down by our families. And fourth, we see that they lost Jesus in a moment. However, it took them three days to find him. Mary and Joseph, unfortunately, were rather quick to leave Jerusalem. They were rather quick in losing Jesus. However, finding him once again took more time. They were a day's journey away from Jerusalem before they realized that he was lost. And then once in that city of Jerusalem, it took them three days to search for and find him. 
we too can fall within this snare. We can obey the, the gospel, yet follow after the example of Demas. That is, loving this present world more than obeying the words of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. We can fail to heed the many warnings in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That is, those things that we can't, handle necessarily on ourselves sometimes we do need help we must rely on our brethren to help us for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing he deceiveth himself but let it excuse me but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for every man shall bear his own burden it doesn't remove our personal responsibility for our own salvation, to being obedient to Christ. Verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. As we said, there are several warnings in this passage. You see, we can choose to violate either of these principles that we've just outlined. We could be overtaken in a fault and then refuse not to repent. We could refuse those admonitions, those attempts at teaching us out of that error from our brethren and go right along in our error and eventually being condemned to hell. We could refuse to restore the one that has been overtaken. We have a brother or sister that is in error and we choose to do nothing. We're in the same boat, as it were. We could even do good throughout our lives, but then grow weary in well-doing. In similar fashion, we could also fail to do good unto all men, especially those in the household of faith. This is why it's so important to search for Jesus early on. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You see, the earlier you get into a good habit, or even a bad habit for that matter, and the longer you progress in that habit, it becomes second nature. Think about being here this morning. Certainly a good thing to worship God as the members of his church, specifically those here in spring. Did you have to think about coming here at 8.30? Well, no doubt there's some have, but you question their faith. This is a week-long thought-out process. Well, I can't do this on Saturday because it's going to hurt my back and I'm not going to be able to get up for Bible class in time. That's a reasonable thought process. If you, if you plan your week around worshiping our Creator on the first day of the week as He has commanded, you're going to pattern your entire life out of that. And if you do it long enough, you're not going to have to think about it. It's like having events like we did yesterday in Fish Hatchery. It's a great lectureship. It's a great time to get together with our brothers and sisters up there who we barely see so we can get to engage in fellowship, but more importantly... We get to hear sound men preach sound gospel sermons. Yet most people didn't show up. That's a problem. 
I think back when I was helping out with our ranch, when it was feeding time for the cows, we had a 92 Chevy, uh, Chevy diesel, and you honk that horn, and all the cows come running because they knew we had range cubes. They knew there was food coming. How many times have we got a honk? There's a feast of the Lord coming, yet only half the herd comes. That's a problem. That's a problem. Remember the Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, but when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. It's easy sometimes to seek after God when everybody else is doing it. But as this world gets more increasingly militant against Christianity, I say that loosely, but specifically against New Testament Christianity, where are you going to stand? Will you have the same boldness of Paul? Or will you be a Demas? I've got to ask myself that every day. It's not easy being around all the heathens of the world. But as a Christian, it must be done. And as Christians, plural, it must be done as the church. Now, we must have a similar attitude about God's word. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. By the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Basically, this is the entire duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. This is an urgent matter. Why? Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed to enjoy the meal that has been prepared next door. James chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 tells us that today is the day of salvation. Because right now is all we've got. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, that is their own way, and the unrighteous man his own thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God for he will abundantly pardon. As we've considered the account here of our Lord. And how his parents lost him in Jerusalem. And then later would search for him. What a scary thought to be in that predicament. The most unlikely people lost Jesus. That is his parents. They were no doubt good people. Yet they lost their son. And after much searching, they were in fact able to locate him. Many today have lost Jesus as well. Some have obeyed the gospel. Yet... Others have returned to the to world, while others never searched for him to begin with. You see, when one becomes accountable, they're expected to obey the commands of God. They're accountable for their sins. They have the obligation to seek after God while he may be found. Yet they choose not to. Now if you're part of this group that has never searched for God, why not? Search for Jesus. Read the Bible. Study with us today. For there is a solution that's been given. Just as Mary and Joseph needed to return to Jerusalem to find their lost son, 
we too must return to Jerusalem. That is, the old Jerusalem gospel that is designed to save man from his sins. The answer is not in Rome with the Pope. It's not in Mecca with Muhammad. And it's certainly not in Salt Lake City with Joseph Smith. And the list can go on and on with all the different denominations in existence today. This is the solution rightly divided. That is the word of God. Search for Jesus. Search for God while he may be found. And you will indeed find him. In order to locate Christ and his people, we must go to Jerusalem. After all, where is the first gospel message preached from? Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 47. This was the beginning of the preaching of the gospel of Christ. That saving doctrine that is applicable for us today. Here one will find the body of the saved, that is the church. Have you lost Jesus your Savior today? Are you a child of God, yet you have followed the example of Demas, and you have returned to the world because of the pleasures found therein? Or have you lost Jesus from the standpoint of being accountable, yet never searching for him once again? Why not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Believing in Him, repenting of your sins, confessing Him before others, and ultimately becoming or being baptized in water for the remission of your sins. If you are in either of these groups, why not make it known now as together we stand and sing the selected hymn?